Greetings, one and all, and welcome to, finally, another episode of Time Traveler the 1930s. On today's episode, the iconic, talented, sometimes strange, but always interesting, Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia was born on November 15, 1887, in a farmhouse in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. She was the second of seven children born to Frances O'Keeffe of Irish descent and Ida Toto O'Keeffe. Ida's maternal grandfather was a Hungarian count who migrated to the United States in 1848. The family ran a dairy farm and young Georgia attended the town hall school in Sun Prairie. It was at the tender age of 10 that Georgia decided to become an artist. She took lessons from a local watercolor artist and attended high school as a boarder at the Sacred Heart Academy from 1901 to 1902. In 1902, the O'Keefe family moved from Wisconsin to Williamsburg, Virginia to pursue a business opportunity for Francis that never quite worked out. Georgia had stayed in Wisconsin with her aunt and moved her education to Madison Central High School. She moved to Virginia to join her family in 1903. High school continued at the Chatham Episcopal Institute in Virginia, and she graduated in 1905. During her time at Chatham, she became a member of the Kappa Delta sorority. Next for Miss O'Keefe was a spot at the top of her class at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago from 1905 to 1906. She was a rising star when typhoid fever wiped out a full year of her education. In 1907, she attended the Art Students League in New York City. In 1908, she won the league's William Merritt Chase Award for her still life oil painting, Dead Rabbit with Copper Pot. While in New York, O'Keefe attended a number of galleries, including one owned by future husband, Alfred Stieglitz. Sadly, in 1908, Georgia found out that the funding for her studies had run out. Her father had been forced to file bankruptcy and her mother had fallen ill with tuberculosis. Georgia was looking for a job. She wasn't sold on a career as a painter, but she was happy to find a job as a commercial painter in Chicago through 1910. She was forced to return to Virginia to recover from a case of the measles shortly before moving with her family to Charlottesville, Virginia. She remained with them for four years and did not paint during that time, stating that the smell of turpentine made her ill. In 1911, she began teaching. One of her positions found her back at her former school, Chatham Episcopal Institute. In 1912, she took a summer art course where she learned about the techniques of Arthur Wesley Dow. Dow was influenced by Japanese art and its design and composition began to influence O'Keefe. She experimented with its more abstract concepts, veering further and further away from realism. She taught art in Amarillo, Texas public school system from 1912 to 1914 and returned to the University of Virginia in the summers to refresh her own art in their art classes. She took a class in the spring of 1914 at the Teachers College of Columbia University with Dow he continued to shape her ideas surrounding the creation of art. All of her classes during this period were a turning point for her as an artist. This period of her life is when she truly found her artistic voice. She was later credited with a key role in establishing the American modernism movement. She moved to South Carolina to teach at Columbia College and began a series of charcoal sketches based on her own personal feelings and sensations. She mailed a few to a friend at Teachers College who delivered them to Alfred Stieglitz at his gallery. Stieglitz decided to exhibit 10 of her drawings in April of 1916. She found herself in Canyon, Texas at the end of the year, teaching for the West Texas Normal College, where she began a series of watercolor paintings based upon the breathtaking views of Palo Duro Canyon. She was enamored of sunrises and sunsets and tried to capture the melting of light that occurred at those magical times in Light Coming on the Plains, number one. 
This 1917 painting used blue and green pigments that floated and blended into each other, simulating the effect of light in the atmosphere. Despite this beautiful new chapter that was exciting Georgia so much, Stieglitz encouraged her to veer away from watercolors because they were an indication of amateur female artists in the public eye. Stieglitz was older than Georgia by 24 years and he enjoyed providing financial support and locating places for her to stay and to paint, taking on a managerial role at times. They grew closer while together in New York in 1918. He began to promote her work regularly and also in 1918, Georgia became a victim of the Spanish flu pandemic. When she recuperated, she began to paint natural subjects, leaves, rocks, flowers, and trees. She drew inspiration from the Precisionism movement, an art form that was born out of the Cubism and Futurism movements in art. Stieglitz convinced Georgia to move from Texas to New York, providing her with a small studio to work in. He began to take a series of nude photographs of Georgia using his family's private apartment. Alfred was married. It is alleged that his wife returned home during one of their sessions and soon after, he left home. He found a place for them to live together in the city, although they tried to be modest by sleeping apart as roommates. This did not last very long. They were soon sleeping in the same bed and taking romantic trips together, such as their jaunt up to Lake George to the family estate at Oak Lawn. They behaved like young lovers, chasing after each other and worshiping each other's bodies at every moment of the day. Stieglitz's photographs were exhibited at the Anderson Galleries, creating a public sensation. He made more than 350 portraits and over 200 nude studies of Georgia. Later in life, she regarded these photos as part of the life that she lived long ago, quite detached from who she was, saying, it is as if in my one life I have lived many lives. After several years of legal delay caused by Alfred's former wife, O'Keefe and Alfred Stieglitz were married before the Justice of the Peace on December 11, 1924, and began a decades-long romance of supporting each other's pursuit of fulfillment, both personally and professionally. They lived in New York and spent summers in Lake George, where she continued to find subjects to paint. Alfred was a fan of Georgia's interest in natural subjects and her talent at depicting nature's beauty. Not surprisingly, O'Keeffe's famous flower paintings numbered around 200. Many were large-scale images that magnified the various parts of a flower. Her first, Petunia No. 2, was exhibited in 1925. In 1926, Black Iris III was described by art historian Linda Nocklin as a metaphor for female genitalia, but O'Keeffe denied her interpretation, saying it was simply a flower. She returned to New York City and moved into a 30th floor apartment in the Shelton Holton Hotel in 1925. While there, she painted cityscapes in the precisionist style, among her list of famous paintings, Night, New York, New York Street with Moon, and City Night. In 1928, she painted a view of the East River and the factories that billowed smoke over Queens. Also in 1928, began a devastating period for O'Keeffe, during which she suffered a nervous breakdown. Her trauma was brought on by Alfred's extramarital affair with married woman Dorothy Norman a photographer, writer, and activist. Georgia despised confrontation and internalized the deep betrayal she felt. During this time, she lost a commission at the Radio City Music Hall because of her hospitalization in a local psychiatric facility. The following year in 1929, Georgia traveled to New Mexico and found a new muse, which ended up being the best decision of her life. She often took her good friend, Rebecca Strand, and stayed with a patron of hers who happily donated a studio for her to paint in. The location inspired a majority of her work from that day forward and became a place that she deeply loved. She spent large portions of each year collecting inspiration from the desert, collecting bones and rocks, and making forms that pleased her and that she could paint. She liked to call the untouched lonely landscape the faraway 
she was compelled to paint it. She began to take commissions and became a very well-known American artist as 1936 began. She was being exhibited in New York and a few other locations. She completed one of her most famous paintings during this period, Summer Days. She received a peculiar offer from the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, now Dole Foods, to create pineapple paintings for their advertising purposes. She ended up going to Honolulu in February of 1939 and ended up having the most free and productive period of her painting career, finding exotic flowers and landscapes to paint. She had a wonderful time, but left after nine weeks, having never painted their pineapples. After returning to New York, Hawaiian Pineapple sent her a pineapple plant directly to her art studio. She produced two paintings, which came at a time when her career was slowing down and she enjoyed the resurgence in public popularity, now at the age of 51. In the 1940s, O'Keeffe became the subject of two retrospectives. The first one was held at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1943. The second was at the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan in 1946. She was now being hailed as one of the first significant American female artists. The Whitney Museum of American Art began an effort to create a catalog of her works throughout the 1940s. Also during this period, Georgia discovered the Black Place, roughly 150 miles west of her ghost ranch where she spent summers and the White Place, nearer to her home in Abiquiu, New Mexico. They were hill formations that resembled elephants in procession with white sand at their feet. She painted them and continued to transform her surroundings into surreal, immersive images. In 1946, she began to paint images of her Abiquiu house with more architectural aspects. This period lasted for several years, fully submerging her in the New Mexico landscape, studying its shapes and structures. As the 1950s approached, she drifted into even more esoteric lanes with paintings such as Ladder to the Moon in 1958. Her work continued to melt into new visions, and as she arrived in the 1960s, Georgia was painting cloudscapes inspired by her views from airplane windows. Her mind was looking for form and inspiration in every corner of her world. Another retrospective was planned by the Worcester Art Museum in 1960, creating another surge in her popularity. Years later, the Whitney Museum of American Art arranged for a Georgia O'Keeffe retrospective exhibition, further solidifying her place in the previously male-dominated world of art. O'Keeffe's world shrank as she aged, mostly due to the loss of a majority of her eyesight due to macular degeneration. In the end, she was left with only peripheral vision. She ceased production of oil painting unless she had assistance and returned to the watercolor medium in 1972. She produced a series of watercolor paintings and then turned her attention to writing an autobiography. It was published in 1976 and became a bestseller. O'Keeffe refused to join the feminist art movement despite the fact that the general public and art critics alike saw her as a visionary and a feminist. She was a beacon to women who saw female eroticism depicted in her paintings when male iconography had been all anyone had seen for centuries and saw its representation of freedom for all women and their desire to express themselves. Georgia had become much more than an artist to the world. When she was no longer able to paint, she continued to work on charcoal and pencil sketches. Now, to return to the love story with Stieglitz. In 1945, Georgia purchased a second home in New Mexico and was spending a considerable amount of time there. But the following summer, Alfred suffered a cerebral thrombosis. She flew to be by his side in New York and arrived just in time. He passed away on July 13, 1946. Georgia spent the better part of the next three years settling Alfred's estate in New York City. With the task complete and now a widow, she returned to New Mexico and moved there permanently in 1949. She spent time traveling around the world in her later years, even rafting down the Colorado River. And perhaps most controversial, she hired a live-in assistant named John Bruce Hamilton, nicknamed affectionately Juan. 
Hamilton had recently divorced and was out of work, so he gladly accepted the position. He was nearly 60 years her junior, taught her how to work with clay and pottery, and encouraged her to resume painting with his help. Rumors were rampant, even though they were simply companions. He said her personality was prickly. She could be lovely until something upset her, and when she was unhappy, she was unbearable. But he stayed with her, and she developed a deep affection for him. He assisted her with her best-selling autobiography, among many other things, and helped her move to Santa Fe when her health became fragile in her 90s. She left the desert for good on March 6, 1986, when she passed away in relative peace. After her death, her will was contested by the surviving family. O'Keefe had made several amendments to the will during the 1980s. She wanted to leave almost her entire fortune to Hamilton. Eventually, they settled out of court and the case became an example for precedent in estate planning. And so that is the end of her story. It is short and sweet. And we're not even done making her room at the hotel. <laughs> um, yeah, there are quite a few juicy, juicy articles and stories written about O'Keefe and her personal life. <clears throat> and just how um, she was a very private person. A lot of people who see her in photos think she was very um, calm and just sweet, mild of demeanor, but a lot of people that knew her said that she had a very strong personality. And um, I don't, I don't want to say she was argumentative because she didn't like confrontation, but she definitely had opinions and she was happy to share them, which I think we can see in her artwork. I think everything that she painted and her sketches and even her photograph, her facial expressions um, in the photographs that Stieglitz did of her are all very intense. She's just a very intense person all the way around. Uh, I will attach a few references down below that maybe uh, talk about some of the private aspects that people have speculated about. Most of the references talk about Stieglitz's infidelity, but they don't really speak a lot about uh, Georgia's, even though it's mentioned here and there in articles that she had her own infidelities. Um, I don't have a timeline. I do know that books have been written and there are several articles about Georgia O'Keeffe as an LGBTQ icon because she was kind of a pioneer in being openly in relationships with uh, at least two women that are documented. Um, and I don't know how openly that was. I mean, we weren't there, right? So it's very possible that it came out after the fact or it was speculated about during her lifetime um, and certain people in her circle knew about it. But nevertheless, her very good friend, Rebecca Strand, was one of the women that she allegedly had an affair with as well as um, one of her wealthy art patrons named Mabel Dodge Luan. Um, and Beck, Beck was what she affectionately called Rebecca. So Beck and Mabel and Georgia would have weekends in, uh, in New Mexico where they would just, you know, have a, a good old time. We don't know what they were doing and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I hear a lot of talk. I see a lot of articles discussing her same-sex affairs and I feel like she was just somebody who was searching for what she wanted and needed out of life and I mean I'm happy for that to be whatever it was we all have our experience and our journey do we not so I feel like it's kind of funny that it's made such a big deal of I feel like from a pioneering standpoint of someone kind of in the public eye coming out as gay is that's great however Let's not overblow it into a, wow, that's crazy situation. Um, I did find a lot of inflammatory type articles that were kind of raising an eyebrow at her, but she was kind of a, a free spirit and she did what she wanted and she chased her, whatever dream she could chase, she chased it. Um, I have respect for that. I'm, I kind of try to be that person, but obviously live within the confines of my own societal structure. So I'm sure some of you can relate. And now I've talked way too long. We're still building and we still have a little bit to go in the video, but I don't wanna ramble just for the sake of rambling. I wanna thank everybody who has been there waiting patiently for this episode. I hope it lived up to 
what you were hoping for Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, again, not a lot of information out there. So I had to search and scour for, you know, corroboration on things that I would find in various articles. And I didn't see anything as substantial as I have for li literally everyone else that I've covered in Time Traveler. So I hope we got a good chunk to represent her. And I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you made it to the end, thank you even more. I really appreciate that. And I love you guys. I will try to get the next time traveler out in a much more timely fashion uh, in the next couple weeks or so. And until then, I hope that you all are happy, safe, and healthy, and that you have a beautiful day. Bye.